everybody and welcome to the Center of Addiction and Faith and to our monthly webinar and discussion. So grateful you are here today. We have a very special topic and a guest this month. Keaton Douglas is here to talk about her work and her book. We also welcome a new webinar host. Our previous webinar guest, Pastor George Wood, will be hosting today. So we're grateful to have George join the Center of Addiction Faith team for these monthly webinars. Keaton's Douglas's book, The Road to Recovery, Responding to the Crisis of Addiction, is available through the link that you'll find in the chat page. Later, we'll tell you about an opportunity to attend a book study that Keaton herself will be leading. So we have about 180 people registered uh, for this webinar. Actually, it's higher than that. Uh, when I wrote this down, it was uh, before more people registered. So it's probably closer to 190, but we're so delighted to have that kind of interest. We'd love to know where you're from. If you'd let us know by putting your name and your location in the chat page, it'd be fun to see where everybody's coming from this day. And then as we get toward the end of the hour, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you think of questions, please use the Q&A button on your, on your browser, on your uh, Zoom browser, and you can put the question in there and we'll take them as they come. Uh, you can put your question in the chat page, but it tends to get lost there. So use the Q&A button if you can. My name is Pastor Ed Treat. I'm the founder and director of the Center of Addiction and Faith. Here at the center, we are working hard to awaken faith communities to address the problem of addiction. We believe faith communities can and should play a bigger role in solving the addiction crisis. By better addressing the problem, faith communities could not only save a lot of young lives, but also reduce crime, reduce homelessness, reduce incarceration rates, and so much more. Addiction is really tied to nearly every social issue today. Now, before we begin, let's pause for a moment of silence to consider those who suffer from addiction, and we'll follow that with the serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Our webinar host today, as I mentioned, is George Wood. Pastor Wood is a published author, an ordained minister, a pastoral care counselor, a recovery minister. He's a founder and recovery, he's a recovery ministry founder and a recovery activist. He's a former addict and suicide survivor. He has dedicated his life to a radically grace-laced, Christ-centered recovery for people struggling with addiction, with mental health problems, and suicidal thoughts. George works tirelessly to bridge the gap between the spiritual and scientific communities to help people see recovery differently and build a new baseline for trauma-informed care. He's charismatic. He's well sought after as a teacher and preacher, and he's become a non-traditional recovery authority by founding radically divergent ministries, including the Timothy Initiative and the Sober Truth Project. George is the newest member of the board at the Center of Addiction and Faith. We're delighted to welcome him as the new host of this monthly webinar. George, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, having me back. A lot of times people have me once and then I never hear from them again. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you. So everyone, I have to tell you, I am, I've been looking forward to this for the last couple of months because um, it was back in October, and I had just have to say this. Um, I'm at the Center of Addiction and Faith Conference in Minnesota, and um, it, we're getting towards the the final day of the conference. And you now, meanwhile, I, for the last few days, I'd been there around this, you know, very professional um, woman herself. She's all put together and uh, very well spoken. And you know, I didn't really know much of who she was or what she did. But um, she was, you know, given the stage to give one of the final talks and I'm sitting there with my wife and she comes up and she starts giving her talk in song. And <laughs> and man, can this woman sing? I was completely I'm like, what is happening right now? But then I found myself more and more drawn into what she was doing, what she was singing, what she was saying, and the message that she had. 
And it was just an experience that I think even up until this day, my phone is filled with little video clips of her singing throughout her talk. And it was an absolute uh, joy and, and pleasure and revelation um, to, to meet her and see her and hear about the work that she does and, and just the impact that she's had. And there's, you know, I've, I've have my own little story and career, but there's a few times that I've met people that I say, I want to be that person <laughs> one day. That's what I'm trying to get to. Um, and, and Keaton Douglas is certainly that to me. I can look at the ministry work that I've done and and look at hers and be like, that's where I'm headed. And I hope to get there one day. And I may not even get there, but at least I can look at the work that she's done um, and the life that she leads and, and the things she's done and say, um, someone's done it. And so it can be done. And I'm just really honored to be sitting here um, and speaking with uh, Keaton Douglas today about her work and, of course, about her book, which I've read, and it is amazing. Um, so let me just uh, say welcome to Keaton Douglas today. Pastor George, I am humbled um, by your beautiful introduction. I am not worthy of that. I am I am a simple servant. I'm doing the work of the Lord, and I am happy to do it in concert with such wonderful folks such as yourself and Pastor Ed and the Center of Addiction and Faith, which is a home away from home from me. So thanks for having me here today. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think um, we have to start off with um, a little bit of your story, at least, right? People have to know, know the, the person. Um, and so tell us a little bit about how you know, we got to this place where you're, you now have an amazing organization called I Thirst, which is doing phenomenal work, um, educating and equipping, um, you know, leaders and lay leaders to do the work of the cross, to do the work in the recovery fields, um, and, and write author of an amazing book. But you didn't start off like a lot of us in the recovery field. You didn't start off with a needle in your arm. Um, you know, it wasn't, you know, looking at the bottom of a bottle. No. Um, it wasn't the, a lot of those paths that some of us have taken. Yours is a little bit different. So maybe you could give us a little bit of that sure. story. I'm happy to, you know, I always think that God chooses the, the least likely people to do his work. Mm. Right. Yeah. And, um, I had a, a wonderful career. I was a professional entertainer and a singer and had a lot of opportunities, uh, in my life to perform for big events, um, and I was doing quite well, but I had my own period of loss, George, and that was the unexpected demise of my first marriage, um, which really left me spiritually bereft, very angry and very filled with resentment. Um, that resentment lived within me. Like I always say, it's like a poisonous rattlesnake. You know, I felt like that. It just held on to me for so long. And uh, it colored how I was in the world. I felt isolated. I felt... Um, shame that I couldn't keep my marriage together. I was just shocked by all that had happened to me. And it started a really bad period of my life, a period of eight years filled with resentment and anger. I really wasn't who I was supposed to be, who God created mm. me to be. I had a blessed moment of forgiveness, which is um, a book into itself. Um, and, and God really stepped into my heart and he took my hardened heart and he really softened it up. He really softened it up and he called me closer to him. So I always say I had a reversion back to the faith. Um, and uh, I came into the faith and wanted to know who was this God that had changed me in one minute. I really did have that moment of conversion. I had my own story, my own Damascus Road conversion, as it were, back to who God really wanted me to be. But this time he was calling me in deeply into deep communion with him. And as you said, you know, my issue was never substance use disorder or any other sort of unnatural attachment of that sort. But it was really um, a, a resentment that lived in my heart. When I became open to, to God, I wanted to know more about him. And I went to school. Mm. I got my master's degree in theology at Seton Hall University. And I began talking, giving talks, because people said, hey, you're nicer. You're nicer than you used to be. So I, I was asked to speak at different places and, and talk about how Jesus had healed my resentment, had healed that hole in my heart. And uh, one day I was asked to speak before 25 women that were suffering from heroin addiction on a retreat 
the retreat was in New Jersey, um, sponsored by the Missionary Servants of the Most Holy Trinity, which is a community of priests and brothers founded 102 years ago by a Vincentian priest, Father Thomas Augustine Judge, who very prophetically understood that people who were poor and abandoned amongst those people were those that were suffering from addictions. So mm -hmm. they had been running this ministry. They also had St. Joseph's Villa. They were working with clergy for years. And I came into this room, George, and I had to speak to these, these women about how Christ had healed me. And I was nervous because I thought that they, I had never smoked marijuana. Mm -hmm. I thought, what are they going to think of me? So I gave them my story. I sang, I gave them my story of brokenness. And at the end of that story, we were all deeply hugging each other. And, and, and what had happened was something that was miraculous to me because I did not see those women as different than I. I saw us as all having been broken and all needing spiritual healing. I had been afforded that spiritual healing because I had come back to Christ and let him mm -hmm. in my heart. And I knew that that's what these women were looking for. And the most important lesson I learned that day was that it doesn't matter what breaks us. We are all broken. We all suffer. We are mutually wounded, but we can be mutually healed. And so it began this, this question in my mind, what do I do with this information? And one little tidbit of a story, the next day after I spoke to those women, I was um, I had this euphoria a real euphoria about me. I, I never had it before and I've never had it since. And I remember going to my priest the next day and saying, Father, I don't know what this is, but my heart has changed. And he said, Keaton, I think you've been called. I said, called? I'm like, listen, I'm in theology school. I know who gets called. Like Isaiah gets called. Right? I mean, he's got that thing on the tongue, like things like that. I'm like, listen, I'm just a singer. I live in New Jersey. Nobody's called. He goes, no. Every one of us gets called, but not every one of us listens. Mm. And that began my affiliation with the missionary servants of the most holy trinity and developing this ministry, which is now the 21st century manifestation of Father Judge's original charism, which is to serve the poor and the abandoned, but specifically in our realm to serve those that are suffering from mm. all sorts of addictions. Wow, that is beautiful. And on a side note, you know, because your your life is so fascinating to me, you, you've you been a singer, um, obviously, and also worked on Wall Street, correct? Yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah, I got out of college and that, you know, that's that was the place to go, like in the, the late 80s. And that's that's where I made a living until I realized, hey, I I don't really want to be here. This is not the kind of. <laughs> so I, I, I was very blessed that I was able to go follow my dream, which was to be a professional musician. And it worked out quite nicely for me. So God wow. called me elsewhere. <laughs> Dude, God called you Amen. elsewhere. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I, I've seen the Wolf of Wall Street. That's not a good yeah, movie. It so, to, so that's not it wasn't good. where the Lord wanted me either. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so the Lord calls you. And now what's interesting, and I'm sure some of our people listening or watching or whatever, um, because we all come from different faith backgrounds, but it's mainly a Catholic you're, you went through Catholic study sure. um, and came through most of like even the things that you're mentioning now being Catholic. But I've I've read the book, like I said, um, and, and though you mentioned Catholic things, I want to be clear, you don't have to be a Catholic to read the book or to understand the message that you're giving. Yes, a hundred percent. I mean, it is, it is, it is done from the Christian viewpoint. Of course, I am a Catholic. That is my faith tradition. Um, when I wrote the book along with my wonderful co-author, Lindsay Schlegel, um, who's just a great, a great writer and helped organize my, my passionate thoughts. Um, when I wrote it, it was because we really felt that there needed to be a systemic response from mother church to this disease. If we recognize that the hallmarks of this disease are indeed spiritual. Amen. Then what as church, capital C, what were we doing about it? And the answer was not much, mm. you know, and while there are individual congregations or individual faith communities that have wonderful, wonderful um, uh, ministries and recovery ministries, as church, there was no systemic response. And we decided at that time, you know, with the missionary servants behind me in partnership with me, that that needed to change. Mm. They are as committed as I am. And yes, exactly as you're saying, and many of the people that 
that have joined us in this mission are from all over the world. Uh, there are different faith denominations, um, but all recognizing that there is a spiritual component to the disease Amen. of addiction that our faith communities must provide in concert with the clinical brothers and sisters that are doing the great work on mental health mm -hmm. and on physiological issues, but the spiritual issue cannot be ignored by our faith communities. That's, mm. that's the point, George. Amen. And, you know, I, I, I say to people that recovery is going to be what starts the next great revival because it's going to be what helps us all see that we need the answer to be Jesus. Um, no matter how you, you get after Jesus or the way that you pursue Jesus, but it's still Jesus. And recovery is helping congregations and denominations recognize that, yeah, maybe certain congregations or denominations have beliefs about water baptism or certain theological differences. But when it comes down to addiction or recovery and how mental health is handled, nobody has a lock on that other than Jesus. And and that should unite us rather yeah. than divide us. Oh, absolutely. I don't believe in division at all. I want all the help I can get from every congregation mm -hmm. and every denomination and, and every person. All you need is two things, and that is a love of God mm. and a desire to help those that are on the margins and who are vulnerable. Those are the Amen. only two things that you need. Right? No particular, right? That's what we need to do. And that's when we get people all fired up. Yeah. yeah. And what we do, I, 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 you know, what we also do is we also train people to go out and meet people where they're at. Mm. Okay. So, you know, I may be a Catholic, but the way that I go in, when I speak in prison, so when we train people for the marvelous reentry programs that we have, or the wonderful, um, prison ministries that we're doing all over the country, indeed all over the world now, is learning to meet people where they're at. Because not yes. everybody's going to be a Christian. Not anyone's going to be a believer. But how right. do we open eyes and hearts and minds to folks so that they realize that there is a spiritual dimension of wellness, whatever that might mean for them, mm. that yes. they need to explore. And so if you come into my faith community, I'm going to speak to you, I'm going to put on my hat, and I'm going to speak to you through the prism of my spirituality. But when I go out, or any of those whom I've trained, and I've seen an awful lot of them come in here tonight, so praise be to God, thank you for being here. We go out and meet people on the margins, wherever they are at in their lives, yeah. spiritually. Well, I can tell you from personal experience. So I have been in recovery uh, for 20 years now. Um, I, I say, I usually say I've been, you know, more of a sober for 18 years, but I've actually been trying this recovery thing for over two decades. And um, I can tell you that 20 years ago, it was more than common to try to get help from a Christian mm -hmm. where they tried to first um, get you to believe like they believed right. rather than even addressing the addiction at all. It's like, it's sort of, you know, it, it, it's almost like some places where they want to feed the homeless, they'll make you listen to a message first right. and then feed you, right. which I, I personally think is wrong. I'm like, if mm -hmm. someone's hungry, let them eat. And if they want to stick around and listen to your message, Amen. they'll listen to your message. But anyways, I digress. But the the in the past, people did want you to, hey, you need to believe this way or yeah. whatever before yeah. this church can help you. And it's no wonder we haven't done a great job and we need people like yourself to come along and help us yeah. see the way. You know what, George? I remember one of the one of the most delightful things I remember is is running a retreat through the, the shrine of St. Joseph, part of the missionary servants, where we would we would host for years a different halfway houses and whatnot. And you know, the fellows or the ladies that came mm -hmm. there, they were all all sorts of, of, of belief, levels of belief, different systems of belief, et cetera. It was a, a really a mixed bag and it was wonderful because it was really about getting them to understand that that spiritual dimension is so important. And for, for months, I would get text messages in the morning from my Muslim brothers that were down in South Jersey that just were so thankful. Because I think the main message is, yes, we need that to develop that spirituality, but we, we as individuals need to be able to listen and hear and acknowledge those who are suffering you know, and help yeah. them along that spiritual journey. My, my role is always to help people develop a relationship and intimacy with the God of their understanding. 
Amen. Amen. And helping them find their, their way because I, I personally, I, that's my life. I love being around people with all different beliefs and yeah. levels of beliefs and Amen. some crazy beliefs. And, and, yeah. and it's just, yeah. it's just a wonderful experience of, yeah. of life. So, so tell us just briefly about, you know, you're now the director and founder of I thirst right. and the, we're going to get into the book in just a moment because sure. the book is really um, a, a way of getting that message out there. But what is I thirst? Sure. And we'll get to that first. So, so after I, I spoke to those women, I became a wonderful member and, ex, and I was so delighted to be there uh, of that retreat team. And that was uh, the retreats would be held every uh, twice a month um, and welcoming folks from various halfway houses and treatment facilities. And there would be volunteers there that would not try to proselytize, but just love on people, just, just give them their humanity back by listening to them. And uh, when my mentors left and went on sabbatical, I wound up becoming the program coordinator. Who knew that that would be where I was going, but I was called to this work. And, um, and this is when I approached the leadership of the missionary sermons. And I said, listen, what is the systemic response from church? And they said, no, well, there really isn't one. Mm. What do you want to do about it? And my one mentor, Brother Joe Dudek, said to me, um, go write, start writing something. So I began to write a curriculum, which was my response to the recovery coach training that I had undertaken. I was a recovery coach trainer uh, in, in the secular world, um, but I was astounded that in that training, there was so little about spirituality. And um, I thought, wow, you know, we really need a response, a, a spiritual response to create people who can companion people, who can accompany people along this mm -hmm. journey. So I wound up writing a curriculum. Now, the words I thirst, right, are they're the fifth of the last seven utterances of Christ on the cross, of course. Mm -hmm. However, the word thirst is an acronym for the Healing Initiative Recovery Spirituality 12 Step. We are ardent proponents of the 12 step programs because of their scriptural basis mm. uh, and, and have a great understanding of that and try to educate people to uh, why the steps work, where they're, where they're born out of. Um, and so now this, the I Thirst Initiative sponsored by the Missionary Servants has three prongs to its education and prevention where we do a lot of teaching through Seton Hall University, but we teach individuals how to go back into uh, work with those who are incarcerated and those in treatment facilities. And then we do aftercare and community building. We teach congregations how to build communities in addition to the rooms of the fellowships, AA or NA. We want congregations and faith communities to have um, resources available there at their own, at their, in their own congregations. What can you do to support families? What can you do right. to support folks like that? So it's a big three-pronged program. And now, George, we are, uh, as of this past Monday, when we started our last class, we can officially say we're on four different continents. Mm. We have trained people in four different continents. We're in 40 states here in the United States. Um, we are on six Native American reservations working with folks there. Um, and so the need is is great. The need is great. Oh, yes. The need is is more than great. So we need many, many hands to try to, yeah. to bring it about. And so... You know, for me, reading the book, the your your book, the road to the road to hope, um, responding to the crisis of addiction, which I have my my trusty copy right here, yeah. um, which I found absolutely, you know, just beautiful the way that you just sort of laid everything out, and it is such a great way of telling the story of, um, why we should help, and you know how we should help, and the obstacles to how we help, and. And the shock of disillusionment of, you know, sometimes we think things are going to be easy or it's not going to be hard or it's not going to be painful. And you just you paint such a great picture throughout the entire book of the reality that is trying to do this work and at the same time painting a, a beautiful picture of but the work has to be done. Right. So and I think for a lot of authors, they want to paint a picture that doesn't really tell the whole story mm -hmm. because, well, they're afraid that if I tell you the whole truth, right. you're not going to want to do it. Right. But the reality is, no, it's, it's hard work and um, it was going to continue to be hard. And 
we still do it anyways. Absolutely. And um, so what was the process? I know as an author, what was the process for you of writing the book uh, along with your co-author, Lindsay? Sure. So uh, Lindsay and I had been working together. I had begun writing a memoir. We were introduced by a mutual friend who's a great author by the name of Alan Wright. Dear Mm. friend, great author. I went to him. I said, Alan, I'm writing a memoir about how I, I... Eight months before I was I was singing in Las Vegas and then the Lord calls me and I drop what I'm doing and all of a sudden I start finding myself doing this work of, of recovery and, and loving it and getting deeply involved with it and going to school and all of that. I said, I wanted to write a memoir. I'm working with individuals now that were changing my life, young people in recovery that were trying to seek recovery. And, and I was working with them on an individual basis. And I wanted to tell that story because I found it remarkable as I got to know more and more about this disease and the families that suffered and the people that were suffering from it. And um, he introduced me to Lindsay and she became my editor at first. But you know what, George, the, the the book that I had had in my my mind and how it was going to end was not working out that way. It wasn't working out that way. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I don't know how this book, I don't know how this memoir, where is this going? I didn't know. So I, I said, Lindsay, I'm going to shelve this because I don't know. And then the pandemic hit. And one day in late part of 2020, Lindsay called me and she said, you know, I'm thinking about you. And I said, and I you. And she said, uh, I think it's time for us to gather together and get that book out. And I said, I agree, but it's a different book. It's a different book now. It's not my memoir. Now it must be a book that helps educate and empower faith communities that they have an idea what they have to be doing, the obligation we have to those that suffer, even when they suffer on the margins and even when that suffering is very hard to understand. Mm. Right. So we began writing that book. And in 2021, we offered it um, to uh, our Sunday visitor. They were very quick to say, yes, we wanted to publish this. We they had published a book by Jim Wahlberg, uh, Mark Wahlberg's brother, mm. called The Big Hustle, uh, about his memoir uh, through addiction. So ours is kind of a, 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 I want to say like a companion book, a, a how to, a how to understand this in your faith community. And within um, the next year, it was published. We worked on it for a year and uh, it was published um, last spring. Um, And we were, uh, blessedly, we were um, out of print before it was even released for the actual print date. So um, it it had been so beautifully accepted and we were, know that people are thirsting for this kind of information in their congregations. You know, what Mm -hmm. can you do? What can you do, George, tomorrow in your congregation? What can you do next month? What can you do looking long-term? What can you do ecumenically? What can you do with other, you know, with other, whether it be Catholic churches or Methodist or Presbyterian, Lutherans in your community, in your dioceses, et cetera? What what can you be doing Mm. to help? Wow, that is super powerful. I want to read something that I highlighted. um, And I, I just think it was so, so beautiful. You wrote um, early on in the book, our mutual woundedness is our key to understanding any suffering. Even when wounds are inflicted by different instruments or objects, we all experience brokenness in our lives. And I just, I found that to be so powerful because so often the, the response I get is, oh, I'm not a drug addict or I'm not, I'm not, I'm not this, or I'm not that. But the way that you put it, that it's really about our mutual woundedness. And when we can understand that, then we can begin to understand one another. That's right. And and, you, and it's powerful. If you could expound on some sure, of that. Of course. You know, one of the things that I think is so important that you have so aptly said and pointed out is what we strive to do through our ministry, but also through the book, is to what I call dispel the myth of the other. Mm. You know, people don't participate in things if they think, oh, that's for those people. And I want the book, through the book, people to understand we are all those people. We are all people who are prone to unruly behaviors. We are all people that have a propensity for unnatural attachments, right? I I describe it in the language of Dr. Mm -hmm. Gerald G. May, who was a great late psychiatrist who spent much of his life um, really expounding upon the interface between addiction and spirituality. And Dr. May explains it via attachments. You know, we all get these things in our lives 
that keep us distracted from our relationship with God, with our fellows and with ourselves. And I like to describe it like when I'm just saying my, 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 my relationship with God, my relationship with my fellows and myself, that's the actual cross. Mm. That's the cross itself. Yeah. So what are the things that get in our way? Our attachments. And sometimes those attachments become acute. And all we can see is ourselves and the object of our unnatural attachment. So I use the word unnatural attachment and addiction synonymously. Those things that come between us um, and all we see self-centered way is, is ourselves and booze or ourself and, 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 and shopping or pornography or drugs or alcohol, it doesn't matter. But these things keep us from God. And we mm. all have a propensity for that. You know, and I, and I think about, you know, let's look at sacred scripture, right? This is not me making it up and saying, oh, mm. sacred scripture bears this out. It bears out that addiction is a human condition. Look only to St. Paul's letter to the Romans in chapters five through eight, where he talks about the nature of sin and deliverance. But in chapter seven, and I paraphrase, he talks about, I am sold into sin. Why do I do the things I don't want to do, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. we know that even St. Paul, the greatest evangelizer of the Christian faith, was tortured by a compulsion to do something he didn't want to do. Like so many of our brothers and sisters that do not want to wake up in the morning dope sick and do not want to wake up in the morning hungover. Mm. They don't. We can look at Proverbs 23 and verses, um, I forgot what verses they are. It's 28 through something, 35, I think. Anyway, it is about, who, you know, who scream, who shriek. It talks about looking at alcohol in the glass, mm -hmm. seeing it so beautifully claret colored, and then drinking to excess so that you feel like you're below, like you're hanging onto a mast. Mm -hmm. And then when can I see alcohol again, right? It's like the jaywalker in the big book. Right? Yeah. You do something to the point of insanity and you get up and you say, well, I want to do it again. Our spiritual ancestors have struggled with addiction. It is indeed a spiritual condition. So when, when we relate it that way, we relate it in such a way that we're all broken. We all have propensities to these things, even our spiritual ancestors. Then you know what? Maybe I'm not different. Maybe I found out that I wasn't different than those women that suffered from heroin addiction. Mm. I was broken from adultery, George. They were broken from addiction. We all needed the Lord. We all needed a spiritual healing. Yeah. So I think when we talk about that and we, and we open this up and we say to folks in our congregations, you have an opportunity to be part of the solution because we all suffer from something mm -hmm. instead of just making it a recovery ministry. Right. Like only people in recovery want to go there or, or I don't know, I'm not in recovery or I don't want to be. But when we open it up and we say we, we want to dispel the myth of the other, then we all can be involved. It's an invitation to everyone to become mm -hmm. involved in the solution. And you know why this is important, George? Because there are 40 million active people in active addiction, active substance use disorder, ages 12 and up in this country right now. And if you think that every one of those persons has two or three others that are directly affected, their parents, their children, their spouses, we're talking about 100 million people every day that wake up in America with anxiety over either their addictions or their loved one addictions. Mm -hmm. Nearly one out of three people that have this anxiety. There is no ministry. There is no nothing our churches can do that could reach a broader audience than to help with this 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 disease. Yeah, that is is so um, eye opening. If you can wrap your mind around everything you just said, just the way that we are, so many people are impacted by um, addictive, you know, patterns and and beliefs. And I was recently reading, you know, Richard Rohr's book, Breathing Underwater, which, um, you know, he says, you know, everyone is addicted. Mm -hmm. It's just we have to understand that it's like it may just it's our our patterns, our ways of thinking that we're addicted to, our inability to even, our, our ability to believe that our thoughts are who we are, but they're really not, that they're just these thoughts in our head. And we become addicted to the patterns in which we act those thoughts out. And and it's just really eye-opening when we start to realize that it's, it's in, in, you know, my life message, which is, you know, basically not just alcohol, not just drugs. It, it doesn't matter. We all have uh, these attachments that are, um, you know, hurting us. And 
we just, if we could all understand on a different level that we all have this, then we can begin to work towards understanding what to do about it. That's right. But we but have to first break that ice, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I think so, George. I think that that goes toward, you know, once we can truly dispel the myth of the other by seeing not only for those of us who are Christians, when we see somebody suffering or somebody on yeah. the margins, we, we, we want to be able to see the face of Christ in those folks. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say I would also want us to see our own suffering there. Because if I see my yeah. own suffering in the face of that person, then I realize I'm not different than right. you. I too have gone through something. It's not the same experientially as you, but it makes me closer to you. Mm -hmm. I understand you because I see myself yeah. in you. And that is what will help us truly end the stigma of this disease. Yes. You know? And and there are things that we can do, you know, speaking about it mm -hmm. in our faith communities, small ways of bringing it to the forefront and, and being aware of it, um, sharing our stories, mm -hmm. sharing your stories is so important. You know, yeah. so we take these these stories out of the the darkness and into the light. One of your chapters in the book is um, something like a, it, it's going to hurt. Yeah. Um, what were you thinking writing that chapter? <laughs> well, I'll tell you that, you know, it, it reminds me and you and I have spoken about this before. It reminds me of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Right. That, you know, for years, I think that we as church, all of us as people of faith, didn't understand this disease of addiction. And so we acted as though we were the priest and the Levite in that story, you yes. know, and in the cultural context, they didn't want to get bloody or, you know, uh, unholy because they touched. But Jesus comes along and he's telling this. And the, the man is bloodied and beaten. He's lying in the road. And the Samaritan, who himself would have been ostracized for being basically a half-breed, if you will, comes and helps that man, puts him on his beast and brings him right to the inn and says to the innkeeper, listen, here's money. And, and if I owe you more, I'll, I'll catch up with you. And, and the question is that Jesus poses is, who is this man's neighbor? And of course, the answer comes back, the one that showed him mercy. But in showing somebody mercy, you know, I always think that that Samaritan had to pick up that bloodied guy, mm -hmm. how to put that bloodied guy on yeah. his beast. I mean, addiction is messy. It is not, I, it is complex. It involves a lot of, uh, a, a lot of hurt. You know, it's really going someplace that can be very damaging, treacherous, scary, mm -hmm. um, which is why to educate ourselves in the nature of this disease as a disease of mind, mental health, mm -hmm. attachment, repression, as a disease of mind, as a disease of body, the physiology, the brain chemistry and how that is altered and mm -hmm. truly a disease of spirit so that people can be more aware of it, its complexities and whatnot. And that's not easy. I deal a lot with family members Family yeah. members who often have to make very difficult choices in their lives because dealing with the person that they love, that person no longer appears to be there. So sometimes that person is motivated to do things because they are not making rational decisions. Dr. Stephen Bissono, who is a wonderful neurologist here in New Jersey, explained it to one of my classes by saying the brain has truly been hijacked. Mm -hmm. So now that person you know, is doing things and acting in ways that are, that are horrendous. How do we as family react? Well, that's not an easy thing to do, but we're training people to help families see beyond the prism of their own pain, right? Because if yeah. you see, oh, my brother's doing that, he's hurting my mother, I can't stand him. If we fill our hearts with acrimony, instead of love and mercy as the Lord wants us to, mm -hmm. then we don't really equip ourselves to be able to walk and even to detach spiritually from people when we need to. Yeah. 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 Your, your chapter on the, the broken family and, and the mother church is super powerful. And I always love how we all use, you know, all of us in this field use different language around, you know, different things, but the language that you use about the hijacked brain. And um, I just think it's, 
it's a it's a beautiful way to paint the picture that it's not just the choice, right? And right. for me, I always use the language like the fallacy of choice. You think, and I get it, if you think everything a person's doing is simply because they chose to do it, right. then it's easy to hold animosity or whatever, Absolutely. but it's so much more. Um, what would you say as, as we kind of, what is something you want people to know most about this book leading into, you know, I thirst? I would say that, um, this is a book for anyone whose life has been affected by the disease of addiction in any way. I would also say this is a book for anyone whose life has not been affected by the disease of addiction in any way because either you were affected by it or you were there to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm really hopeful for is that people will, will see that there is something that they can do. And if they have a desire to really learn and be certified in how to walk with somebody in this ministry, that mm -hmm. there is a course that they can take. It is our virtual course through Seton Hall University. I've got two of them running concurrently right now. And the blessing of those courses is that people become certified to go back into their various faith communities, to go into their reentry programs, to go into their prison ministries, to go into correctional facilities, treatment facilities, and whatnot, and bring the message of spirituality as a necessary dimension of wellness to those that suffer and to their families. Mm. So it's a practical guide with practical solutions for things to do day to day. And I would say it's important and imperative for you to have it, whether you've been devastated by this disease or you're just someone that recognizes that you can be an agent of Christ's love and mercy to people in your parishes and beyond the pews. Sure. Is there That's anything I'm going to jump in here. Julie, you can jump just in real quick. Yeah. yeah. I just have to do a little, little bit of uh, house housekeeping work, but <clears throat> excuse me, what an amazing conversation. This is so engaging and I'm, I'm realizing the time is flying by. Uh, but as Keaton has so aptly pointed out, addiction continues to take young lives and it ravages our country and homes and families with terrible consequences. And we think the church could really be more engaged when it comes to addiction and mental health. And we're working hard to make that happen. We are uh, a prophetic voice out there in the wilderness crying out to the church. Come on, church, get it in gear. Let's go. People are suffering and there's so much more you could be doing. It's not easy work. Um, it's a topic that church has managed to avoid. It's a topic that people prefer to avoid. Uh, so we have to keep pounding away at it. And we need your help. Uh, we appreciate, if you appreciate the work we're doing to raise awareness, to engage faith communities around these issues of addiction, please consider making a one-time gift or a small monthly gift. Uh, maybe your church has a foundation that could maybe make a gift to us. Uh, we'd love to know about that. But we want to keep doing this work and we can't do it without more help. Um, on the screen, you'll see a Venmo QR code, if that's one of the ways you like to give. And there's also a link to our PayPal portal. You can also mail it to our address if that's the way you like to make your donations. But any amount is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. And thank you to our wonderful guests. We're going to move now to some Q&A. Um, although I don't see a lot of Q&A questions on the, on the board yet. So if you're Wondering what you'd want to ask George or Keaton, please put a question in the Q&A box. Um, there is one in the chat page from Don who says, how about non-Christian? You did touch on this, I think, but he mm -hmm. says, how about non-Christian religions? I learned more about mature spirituality from members of AA than from seminary professors or pastors, which I, I, I would completely agree with, I <laughs> with Don. I, I think that was a brilliant statement. And yes, as as we mentioned, you know, we we train people uh, of all faiths to go out and meet people wherever they are at in their faith communities. It's just about the development of their spiritual lives as a necessary dimension of wellness. So we have worked with many people who are agnostic and atheists and people of different faiths um, in our roles, ministering to them in treatment facilities, those who are incarcerated. And again, you know, nothing that we do is about proselytizing. Uh, certainly we, we share our faith when it's called upon and we're happy to do that. But I know in my own life that they will, they will know I am Christian by my love, right? Right. I am. I. I don't need to go. I. I just gotta love on them because cool. if I be, if I empty myself to make myself a vessel of God's love and mercy, He will do the rest. I want to mm. humble myself. I don't need to go out and do all that. I need to just be a vessel of His love and mercy to those on the margins, and I have full trust that God will reach people as He sees fit, not as I want. 
Mm. I think the big challenge for people today is um, um, knowing what to do. I think we can make, uh, and this has been my experiences uh, mm -hmm. speaking to congregations, is, is people are on board and saying, you're right, we should do something. But then the next problem is, is what on earth can we do? And, right. and that's where a lot of places get stuck. And sure. I think that's mm -hmm. where you can play a big role, Keaton. Yeah. I think that's what you answer. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, we are we are very thankful that we have, uh, as I mentioned, so many um, wonderful people who are who are trained and who are walking with individuals, um, walking with individuals as um, as spiritual companions. And you know, if you go into faith traditions beyond the Christian and even beyond the Judeo Christian tradition, there's many many. Um, uh, other faiths that have had an example of spiritual companionship. And certainly within the Judeo-Christian tradition, you just pick up the Bible and you could see in the Old Testament and the New, uh, Naomi and Ruth or Jesus on the road to Emmaus. There's always these example of people walking together on a spiritual journey. Ooh. And that's really what we're training people to do. So what can you do? You can begin conversations uh, the Diocese of Quincy, Illinois, just ordered 200 of our books because they're doing book clubs because they want to start the conversation. And uh, you want to put out information about, about the fellowships uh, in your gathering spaces. Anywhere mm -hmm. that there is a food pantry. Why do you think people are coming to food pantries? Because they need, probably many of them have some sort of addiction in their family or whatnot. And so we want to have resources that are available. We want to have uh, sermons that speak to this. And I always say, you know, if, if, if a pastor or a, or a priest or a deacon who's giving a sermon or a homily needs to know how, what is the interface between this gospel passage and addiction and recovery, mm -hmm. then they need only to purchase the Life Recovery Bible, which is a great resource. And at the end of it, there are footnotes that say, well, this is where step three comes in. This is where step five comes in. And they, it correlates it so beautifully. Mm -hmm to that because nearly everything throughout sacred scripture is about what happens to us when we when we love our god and we are in communion and relationship with him and when we turn our back like yeah. the story of the israelites to him right the lepers who are those that are on the outskirts of society who are those that don't seek to help each other all of these stories are pertinent to the the story of addiction even from our earliest spiritual ancestors, Dr. May talks about this. He says, you know, um, the story of Adam and Eve is simply repeating itself because those themes of temptation, self-centeredness mm -hmm. and rebelliousness and curiosity and desire are the story of those that are suffering from an act of addiction. Yeah. So we can learn so much from scripture. And I, I, I seek to have faith communities, all faith communities, to, um, I, I want them to understand that they can look within their own faith traditions and find answers, that we don't always have to reach out to the secular world. We want to do it in concert with them, but we mm -hmm. have so much to offer ourselves. Mm. That is so beautiful. What would you say? Have you, like, I know for me, you write a book, you put it out, and then you're like, I wish I would have included this, darn mm -hmm. Is there anything you've come across that you wish you would have included into in, in the book so far? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, a, a lot of thought and prayer went into it. So I, I feel as though the message that I was intent upon sending, uh, we have captured with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's that's what I what I believe. Um, if I could make a point more fervently, perhaps, um, I, I like to think that, you know, that the Holy Spirit really leads us in what we are called to do and say. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel that we're, we, we really do have a, a good niche on explaining to faith communities why they need, why they need, why they have an obligation to those on the margins. You know, George, I had a, um, I tell the story in the book, I, if you remember, um, I, I post a lot on LinkedIn and I invite everybody to uh, to to follow me on LinkedIn because I post a lot there. I'd love to get to know you and your okay. faith communities and answer questions. Um, I'd love to know you there. And um, I, I, I post a lot about addiction and recovery and faith. And um, there was a, a woman who was a, a, a very prominent person, uh, a Catholic writer. And I started writing about it and, and she posted something that was... Um, 
you know, this is a choice. And then and she started going off on, on, on that. And I, you know, my initial reaction was like, what? Like, what, mm-hmm. what a, a misunderstanding, not only of the disease of addiction, but kind of of the gospel message, right? Where we're, yeah, talking. yeah. So, so, um, I created this thing in my head and I, I, I was awake all night trying to come up with something that was going to be succinct and erudite, but was not going to be rude. I don't want to be mm-hmm. rude. I want to be filled with the, the, the love of Christ when yeah. I answer people. Sometimes that's tough, but I wanted to be that way. And I got up the next morning and her comment had been taken, had been removed. Mm. And I was, I was thankful for that, but it showed me that even good people, even yeah. good people of faith don't understand that this is not a choice. And if you consider it a choice, George, I would ask as, as followers of the Lord, as people who love the Lord, whatever your denomination, whatever your faith tradition, isn't it incumbent upon us to figure out if somebody is making these devastating life choices, what is the root of the pain that is causing that choice? Isn't that what we're called to do as people of faith? Mm-hmm. why are you making a choice to disenfranchise yourself i always say people have called it a moral failing people have called it a brain disease people have called it a, a, a bad choice i said i i don't care what you call it <laughs> i don't care there's nothing you can call this disease where we don't have a responsibility indeed an obligation as church as faith communities to walk with those who suffer and to walk alongside their family members mm-hmm Yes. I want to make sure we do get to a couple of these questions here. There is one in there that says, uh, what is the argument uh, from Cynthia? She says, what is the argument against the notion that this spiritual approach is unnecessarily fatalistic in actuality? Um, and I'd like to I'd like to have that question unpacked a little further, but um, do you understand what she's asking there? Um why is so basically if i'm understanding it why why is there a reticence to incorporate the spiritual uh dimension of wellness by yeah and i think you know i'm trying to think of what she's what she's and if cynthia you can clarify this that would be great but um are you saying that the spiritual spirituality is fatalistic i mean that um in actuality um that, that probably would be an interesting question to to deal with but um i, I mean I I, I I i could answer one thing ed and, and i could tell you that um I, I always had um there's always been some reticence by clinical folks um thank you there's always been some reticence by clinical folks to to incorporate and they can't for various reasons in, in the clinical world incorporate spirituality as a necessary dimension of wellness and that's why i feel so fervently that if we were to understand all the dimensions of wellness and there's actually a national institute of wellness yeah and it has six dimensions of wellness and spirituality is one of them so you know you're occupationally well you're emotionally well and socially mm-hmm. well and physiologically well etc and spirituality is a dimension of wellness so if we're completely going to be sane sanos from the late latin which means well we can't omit any one of those things particularly spirituality uh we say we're creatures of mind body and spirit so it's like a three-legged stool to omit that is is foolhardy but i do know that a lot of clinical settings did not want to incorporate spirituality for fear or even bring us in for fear of proselytizing but i think over the years we have demonstrated that we really are there to help people connect with with something that's going to give their lives meaning and purpose. Um, And I think that that is really important, meaning and purpose. And that comes to us through our spiritual lives. It's good. Uh, There's a thank you from uh, from James Escobar uh, for uh, changing his life as an author of his book. It's not a question, but a nice statement. I said J- James, but it's Jellian. It. He did correct it. Jell- he corrected it. And then R.J. Mangan says, how can we practically reduce stigma surrounding addiction? And generally, how do we reduce unhelpful shame in our communities, which prevents people from seeking the help they need? R.J., shame is not- yeah. RJ I'm happy that you're on this call. Um, what what specifically? Okay, let, let's talk about some of the specific things. And I'm going to tell you. So for our, for our, uh, in our parishes coming from the Catholic space, um, what we have been doing is we have something called the prayer of the faithful. 
where we say, Lord, hear our prayer. We ask for things specifically. It's done at every mass. So we have started praying outwardly for those that are suffering from the disease of addiction in their families. May they feel the healing presence of Jesus Christ. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. We're starting to say things from the pulpit and we're encouraging our faith leaders to begin speaking in that, in that way. Um, again, we're putting, we're putting items in our, we have bulletins. So we put information about some of the fellowship meetings that are local to your area there. We purchase mass intentions for, you know, a certain mm. Sunday where you could say this mass is for those that are suffering from the disease of addiction throughout August and September. I buy several for, for my parish um, where the mass that day will be for those that are suffering. And, you know, people come up to me afterwards because they know it is I that put it in. And they say, my son died from, from that disease 15 years ago. And I never, I never talked about it in church. Mm. And I said, well, this is where we're coming. We're coming to a place where we need to talk about it. So allowing our pastors to talk, listen, inviting in uh, some of the fellowship meetings in your churches so that that they are there, I think it's a marvelous idea. But I will say this one caveat, if you do not make it known to the leaders of those specific fellowship meetings that they are welcome in the sanctuary as much as they are welcome in your church basement, then it's only room rental and it's not enough. People need to know that they are included and welcome. Again, fellowship uh, uh, is launching an I Thirst ministry, launching a ministry in your church that that helps uh, where people can come together as family members to talk about the disease. And we have all of these models and we train you how to do this in our training programs. So my, my thing would be, if you were interested in really learning very many of the specifics, the book will help. And, and believe me, God willing, I'll never, I'm never going to be J.K. Rowling because of this book, I'll tell you. So when I uh, invite <laughs> you to, to purchase it, it really is because it is a way of extending the message. Um, having those clubs, having people sit around together, starting those conversations, having our pastors begin to talk about it. For anyone that's desiring to get further education, become certified in it with 4.8 continuing education credits through Seton Hall University, going back into your faith community and leading that recovery ministry. Because the last thing that we want to do, and you both know this, is give our pastors more things to do. Yeah. So we want some lay leadership to step up uh, working in conjunction with our pastors to begin really making a difference. And the first thing is starting the conversation. How are you yep. going to start that conversation in every yep. faith community? Absolutely. Yeah, it is a challenge. I know that um, um, faith communities are not places where people are feel safe or comfortable talking about their uh, personal issues. And why that is, I don't know. But that's what that's the big hurdle we have to overcome in this because... Yeah. People are hurting out there and it isn't yeah. just addiction, it's depression and it's, mm -hmm. it's suicide and mental it's health. all kinds of mental yeah. health. Um, and for some reason, people can't talk about that in their churches. And, and unless we change that, I don't know that the church is going to be relevant to our world. A hundred percent. And you know what, Ed, we have forgotten to be the koinonia yeah. community mm -hmm. in Christ. We have forgotten. We have forgotten how St. Paul set up those small faith communities where they were everything. They were the center that we would go to the church. I wrote a chapter about this, George, in the book. Yeah, you did. Mm -hmm. You know, or a, a segment about it where it mm -hmm. was like, I never thought to call the church where a woman said that to me. And that that's what we have to change. And how will we change that? By continuing this conversation, by doing things that are socially relevant, mm -hmm. by educating ourselves. Right. Yes. Yeah, and that is a problem too, is that uh, the, the understanding of addiction in our culture today is about 50 years behind the times. Uh, there's some great new studies out. There's a lot of good science around it. Most people don't know what it is. And so they're they're mostly reacting out of ignorance. And so we need to we need to address that too. Anyway, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, my great thanks to uh, Keaton. You're just amazing. You always yes. inspire me greatly. Yes. Thank you for the work you're doing and for being here today. Um, yes. Eaton is offering an opportunity to lead a book study with her book. So if you want to get your congregation engaged, yeah. um, get a group at your church together and uh, join this book study of hers. It's a five-week study. It'll be every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So you'll have to do the math for your time zone. Um, we have people <laughs> from all over the country here. It's really extraordinary. We even have someone from India that I saw yeah. in the chat page. So we're international now. So, um, but the book study starts February 21st and it runs through March 20th. Uh, registration for the book study is in the chat page. You can click on that, but we'll be sending out some 
information about how to how to do that. So if you miss it here, you can still get it. But uh, Katie uh, has put in the uh, chat page, the registration page for that book study. Um, and so if you sign up today, as the day gets closer, we'll send you reminders. Um, her book, The Road to Hope, can be found here. And there's a link uh, Katie's going to throw in there for you to get her book. Today's webinar is recorded. It will be available on our free smartphone app and the website, along with the huge library of other great videos. We have uh, been doing this for three years now every month, and so we've got quite a collection of great webinars. Um, our phone app, if you don't have that, you go to your, uh, you know, it's free, go to your app store and look for Center of Addiction and Faith. It is chock full of uh, information, links, tools for addiction ministry, and it's free. I hope you'll download it. And then keep in mind, our conference is coming in October 24th, uh, uh, 2024. Um, hope you'll make plans to be there. Next month, our webinar will feature Christina Dent, founder of End It For Good. She was one of the keynote speakers at our last conference. She's got a powerful message about how we need to deal with addiction in this country. You need to hear what she has to say. So I hope you watch for that upcoming announcement. Again, Keaton, thank you so much. Thank you. And may I just say, Ed, Thank you so much for having me and George for a wonderful conversation. Yes. It's, it's wonderful. But I also want to encourage everybody that's here to become a member of the Center of Addiction and Faith. Whatever your faith um, community, whatever, it is ecumenical. We are out there doing the work and we're doing it in concert with each other. Nobody stands alone. We can support Amen. each other. And I can't think of a better uh, organization with which uh, to be affiliated. I thirst uh, 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 Center of Addiction and Faith and all the marvelous people and my two brothers here who are um, my brothers in faith. And I'm very thankful for this opportunity, guys. Thank you both. And I thank you, Absolutely. George, for being here and, and for your friendship, collaboration, for the work that you do where you are uh, to help those who still suffer. Excellent. And I want to thank all of you who are here today uh, for caring about this important topic. And may God bless you in your efforts to, uh, to, to help those who still suffer. There's plenty of work to do. Yeah. Uh, I invite you now to go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks. Amen. Amen.